Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for making time to join Race Oncology's special investor briefing for tonight. My name is Jane Lowe. Uh, I'm very proud to support Race on Investor Relations, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Uh, the format for tonight is we'll have a, a short presentation delivered by CEO Phil Lynch and CSO Dr. Daniel Tillett. Um, and after that, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so anytime using the Q&A function in the Zoom ribbon at the bottom of your screen. We'll get through as many questions as we can in the time that we've got. And we have about 45 minutes, we think, tonight to run through everything. Uh, now, we will answer as many questions as we can. Of course, if there are any that are terribly price sensitive or too complex, uh, they will let you know. Um, so anyway, with that, I'd now like to, um, we'll kick off our screen sharing and I will hand over to Phil to get us started. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Jane. Um, and again, thanks shareholders for joining us um, tonight uh, for this overview. We're going to talk particularly uh, around the quarterly. Um, some of you may have read and, and viewed it, but um, we look forward tonight to giving you more perspective on it. Uh, it was a great quarter. We were very busy. We had a lot happening, as you may have read, but we'll certainly talk to that tonight. Um, it's a good time for us going forward, and we're particularly proud of what we achieved this quarter. Um, next slide. Uh, the disclaimer is there uh, for reference. I, I won't read it out, but um, it's important um, that it's there. Thank you. Next. So let's start with a corporate snapshot, um, reminding you, and, and I will go through this in some detail because I'm, I'm cognizant that some of you may be new to, to race and about what we do and how we do it. Um, we've got about 160 million shares on issue, 30 million options. Um, we're very proud that we've got over 9,000 shareholders and have maintained a number over 9,000, I think, for over 12 months now. So that's a number we're particularly proud of, and we appreciate your support. Um, the share price, um, you may have questions on the share price. Of course, you can see the graph on the right. We have been as high as $4. We raised, many of you would remember, at $3. We're currently over $2 solidly, um, two seventeen dollars on yesterday's close. That gives us a market value of $355. I think importantly, um, we're particularly pleased that we've got cash, that we raised cash late last year, and we did so against a particular strategic agenda that we really appreciated your support of. So those of you that are shareholders and that participated, you've enabled us to commit to um, a very comprehensive strategy that's fully funded and that we're embarking on right now. And no doubt, we'll talk more about that today. Um, our significant shareholders, you know Daniel, of course, will follow me in this presentation. Daniel's got 8.5%. Our chair, Dr. John Cullody, US-based at 5% and Merchant uh, Opportunities Fund, who've been somewhat, I should say, long-term shareholders um, at about 5% out of Perth. Um, the only comment I'll make on that share chart is that um, the big down, downfall there is very much, um, I'll say, sector-driven. Um, biotech, whether it's US or Australia, um, has been really hit hard of late. There's been some recovery, and you can see that recovery um, across the sector, but certainly importantly um, on our performance. So we, we've recovered quite somewhat, but we're certainly not where we want to be or where we think we should be. Um, and we'll touch on that today, no doubt. We're going to move now to some of our pre-clinical and clinical updates, um, which Daniel will take us through. Daniel. Thanks, Phil. So as Phil mentioned, it's been a, <clears throat> a very busy quarter. Uh, it's been a build towards a lot of activity, both clinically and pre-clinically. I think I'll touch first on the um, RR AML clinical trial, which is running in Israel at the moment. We went through the first stage of that, which was the phase one dose escalation. Uh, and that was not intended to uh, show efficacy. It was just intended to work out what's the appropriate dose of the three drugs that are in the uh, trial to use together. So it's Xantrine plus Lidarabine plus Clofarabine. Those combination of drugs have never been used before in uh, humans and so it needs to be whenever you start a new uh, trial like that you need to work out you know what dose can the patients tolerate so when you do those dose escalation you have very heavily typically very heavily pre-treated patients that have experienced a lot of and failed a lot of treatments and the, it's kind of a, a last roll of the dice uh, for many patients and you don't typically expect to see very positive results from that and but i guess maybe not unexpectedly, but certainly happily, we saw that we managed to bridge three of those six patients in the phase one 
to a transplant. And that's really the aim of uh, this trial. If we can get a patient uh, to a transplant, they've got a chance of a cure. Um, and that's, you know, really when you have AML, uh, it's really the only sort of long-term solution to that disease. So extremely positive outcome. It's just the first stage. As I mentioned, the patients were incredibly heavily pretreated, average of four and a half lines of prior treatment, uh, as high as eight lines of prior treatment, which is almost unheard of historically to have that many lines of treatment. Uh, patients typically with AML just don't live long enough to go through that many lines of treatment. And so the phase two has begun. The patients are being recruited into that trial and we expect to be able to update the market as in batches as the trial progresses. So very exciting, really showing the power, I think, of uh, Xantrine to treat this really difficult uh, uh, type of AML. Uh, so it's, it's continued to sort of deliver both preclinically and clinically. Next slide. Uh, we had two pieces of really interesting news preclinically in melanoma. First is that we uh, released at the end of June on improving immunotherapy. Immunotherapy has been the real breakthrough uh, in cancer in the last 10 years. Uh, it's been able to take patients that are on death's door, stage four, weeks to live, give them immunotherapy, and some of those patients have just been turned around and effectively cured. And no cancer left. It's a real miracle um, treatment. The downside of it is for many patients, it doesn't work. And overall, uh, in cancer, only about 10% of patients uh, respond to immunotherapy. And in melanoma, which is one of the ones where it works the best, maybe around 40% of patients will respond uh, for a period of time. So there really is a need for improved treatments uh, in immunotherapy. The downside, I guess, from a drug development perspective is there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of companies trying to improve immunotherapy, trying to add on to the existing PD-1, anti-PD-1 uh, or anti pd one uh, antibodies that are out there. And so you need to have something really compelling uh, and amazing to try and attract the attention of both patients, clinicians, and pharma partners. And so, we undertook a really difficult model in using a mouse model of uh, melanoma. This model doesn't respond to any immunotherapy treatments. Basically, it bounces right off like it's Teflon. And the end result of that is it's a model that's very rarely used by uh, most people trying to develop a, uh, a new immunotherapy um, enhancing uh, treatment. But we went for the hardest thing we could possibly do uh, because on the basis that if we succeed at that, then we'll have something that will really grab the attention. And so what we discovered is that Xantrine is able to improve immunotherapy of anti-PD-1s in three different ways. It can directly target the tumour as an anti-cancer agent directly. It's toxic directly to the cells. It can down-regulate the genes that are involved in avoiding the immune therapy. So they're really important, these uh, immune resistance genes. And the other way that it can do is it can actually activate the immune cells in the body to make them better able to target the uh, tumor cells. That combination is a very attractive combination and something that um, offers a lot of potential uh, going forward. And we uh, believe these results can support uh, future clinical trials in this space. We haven't committed to that at this point. We have a lot of other activities going on. We want to really understand well what's actually going to uh, is going on with these um, enhancements before we step into patients. You want to know everything you can possibly in the lab before you start treating patients. It's still very exciting. Uh, next slide. The I think a day or two later we released. This result about uh, showing that uh, Xantrine showed synergy with BRAF and MEK kinase inhibitors. Um, many of you might remember that we released results at the end of last quarter showing kinase inhibitors in clear cell renal cell carcinoma uh, synergized with those. And there seems to be a general theme that 
uh, xantrine synergizes with what are known as kinase inhibitors. And this is a very attractive market to go after. It's about 30 billion US dollars a year of sales. Kinase inhibitors are the largest anti-cancer class of drugs now on the market. And it seems to be kind of a class effect. We're seeing the same type of effect in multiple different kinase inhibitors in different cancers uh, where we're seeing this synergy. The nice thing about this is it's far less crowded uh, clinically to um, than the immunotherapy. And so there's far fewer trials. Um, so there's need for options for patients beyond just immunotherapy because for some people it's just not going to work. Uh, and this offers an alternative. So you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, some mice and some of the tumors are in the mice. And you can see how combination of xantrine and a, a BRAF inhibitor are able to shrink the tumors more effectively and control the tumors. Uh, very exciting results, We're very translatable uh, and something that we can take and begin conversations with clinicians and other partners over and something we're in the process of doing right now. So this is a, it's a really interesting opportunity. And I think, you know, as a the forefront for this kinase inhibitor synergy, I mean, really to be um, excited about. So to get two results like that is quite amazing just in itself. So that's, you know, it's been quite a, a build up uh, in results. And then the final release uh, looks like, uh, which we released on the 30th of June, the last day of the quarter, was um, that we're able to show that doxorubicin can protect hearts from cardiac damage. And this is a major, I guess, almost completely independent pathway uh, and offers a market you know, potentially as large as directly going after the cancer. We have a market there which is protecting from the thing that makes standard treatments like chemotherapy, um, the, the, um, I guess the limiting toxicity, the thing that causes the most damage from those treatments. So we'd seen this earlier at the, um, at the end of last year, we'd reported on cell work in human cells, uh, cardiomyocyte cells, which are the heart muscle cells, and uh, showed this protection. Um, but we were able to then uh, go into mice and in a mouse model, which is, very well established, it's very translatable. So we know very much how the results in mice translate into humans and vice versa. Uh, so some models, mouse models, don't translate very well from one uh, from mice to humans, but this is a, a really good example of one that does translate well. So drugs that protect the heart in mice will also protect the heart in humans. The thing that makes this particularly exciting uh, is that we have the ability to increase the amount of dose that goes to the patient. Mm -hmm. With chemotherapy, the dose response curve is very steep. And the result of this is if you have able to increase the dose even slightly, you get many more patients into a cure or long-term survival than if you're not able to do so. So one of the things that's really important with this is not only we're able to protect the heart, we didn't see any additional toxicity despite increasing the level of uh, chemotherapy by 40%, uh, we didn't see any additional uh, toxicity in um, on the bone marrow, which is this, the second tissue that tends to get attacked by chemotherapy, and also weight loss. And in mice, unfortunately, mice can't tell you how they're feeling, uh, but what they do is that they're feeling sick, they stop eating and they lose weight very quickly. And uh, that's generally how you know that they're not happy. Uh, so they didn't lose any weight. It's a great result. Um, so we're undertaking to do an animal study right now, looking at you know how this works in a, in a breast cancer model. Uh, we've been doing cell work, uh, which will be reported in this quarter. Uh, we're also uh, doing mouse uh, work, and this all builds together a very nice, attractive package to undertake a clinical trial in this space, which we're well underway in planning and hope to announce to the market in this quarter as well. So a lot going on. We think this is an amazing opportunity. We can talk to Phil. He'll tell you that it's the, <laughs> it is the number one opportunity we have. Um, I'm a little more biased towards the FTO cancer side of things. Maybe it's because I'm a scientist and Phil's, you know, a marketer from background. Um, but both of them are amazing opportunities. Uh, and 
any company would be lucky to have one, let alone two opportunities like this. So I'm very excited. Um, everything you couldn't ask for a better series of results uh, that you could expect for this opportunity. So, yeah, I think um, that might end my section of the slides. I'll okay. back to Phil. Um, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Daniel. That was uh, exciting, particularly on cardio. As you know, I'm, I'm a fan. Uh, we may talk more about that. I'm a fan too. Yeah. It's just, uh, I just, I like <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, they're all my children. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I we're, love them all. <laughs> we're also a fan of um, our on-market share buyback, um, which we we announced uh, recently. Um, we we announced that we would buy up to four million shares over twelve months. I think the words "up to" are important. It doesn't mean we will. It means we've got the opportunity to, should we choose. Uh, and those words are important. Um, purchase at board discretion, we can't buy at more than 5% above uh, five-day VWAP, so that gets calculated every day, and we have the opportunity to, to buy below that price. Um, we said in the announcement, and I'll say again, it's our view that this is an opportunity to address periods where the share price is not reflecting fundamentals and the outlook for the company. So um, I'll, I'll kind of pause on that thought um, because I'm sure you'd like to know, well, how much are you going to buy or when are you going to buy? And frankly, we, we can't really talk to that. You'll have to see our actions reported um, as that occurs. And of course, we've announced that we purchased uh, just in the last two days on both the 25th and 26th of July. Um, importantly, because the question has been asked, um, our committed preclinical and clinical programs remain fully funded, and this program will not detract from those programs at all. Next slide. Um, I, I won't drag you through all the financials, but I just I do want to make a couple of points, if I may, um, around our quarterly results and our financial year results for year. Um, and if you look at the quarter to the left, you'll see that the quarter results effectively reflect what we've delivered for the year or where we've invested for the year. Importantly, if you look at expenditure on the top right um, half of this slide, um, the majority of it, um, if you like, the 80-20, it's going directly into R&D. It's going to product um, and the operating costs of, of designing product for, for trials. So everything we should be doing, in my opinion, we're doing. The amount of money we spend, frankly, on, on advertising and marketing is modest. Um, potentially, we should increase that. Um, that'll be something for the future, of course. But um, And equally, our investment in, in staff, um, us, is, is, I think, equally modest. So I hope you agree, but I did want to call that out. Um, I've also mentioning um, we've got our tax incentive that we got. For those that aren't aware, we picked up $708,000, um, but also we pick up option income. So when options are redeemed, we pick that up as well. Um, so you see that. Uh, you'll also see the cap raise, 29.7 last year. Um, the option exercise funds, um, net, net, we're in a very strong position finishing the quarter of 33.5. And it's in the uh, 3C document that goes, sorry, the 4C document that goes with that quarterly, we're obliged to report how many quarters of cash, if you divide total cash against last uh, quarterly spend, we've got 15.6 quarters of cash. I don't want to mislead you to say that that's the right number, but it tells you that we're in good, in good shape. Um, but certainly we hope and we should uh, expect to see our burn increase as we invest appropriately in continued preclinical, but importantly, clinical programs going forward. Next slide. So um, this was from the quarterly, but you can expect, um, and we've been very busy last quarter, we are busy right now, and we hope to have further results preclinically, um, updates on AML breast, multiple myeloma, kidney cancer, cardio protection in vitro, um, our in vivo studies, um, Daniel touched on some of them that are underway in, in animal work that's going in breast. Uh, which is important. You'll see a lot of references to cardio protection. So we're doing a lot of work to round out and ensure that we've, we're going on our best foot forward. Um, everything we need to do, we will do, uh, and ensure that by the time we're um, going to clinical trial, that we've done all the homework that will make sure we design an optimal clinical trial. You will hear from us in this quarter about how we plan to execute that. That's in cardio. Um, but equally, we, we're still, uh, and I should be clear that we're not forgetting about FTO. FTO is a significant opportunity, to Daniel's point. Um, it's just that we need to do a lot of work. There's a lot of work to do on it, and we've got to be very choiceful and considered about exactly where ultimately we go clinically in FTO, because there's, there's a lot of opportunities. You've heard Daniel talk previously, perhaps, that FTO is in so many cancer types, so we need to work out what type 
and where we can best make a difference and we'll determine that going forward. Um, I think that takes us to close and, and with that we'll move to uh, questions. Great. Okay. Well, I shall stop my screen share. Uh, and with that, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please drop it into the Q&A using the button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you to everybody that told me about the slides earlier. <laughs> I'll skip past all that. Okay, so first up, we've got quite a few questions. Um, how does the board of directors think of the risk versus uncertainty in Xantrine trials considering the past trial success and human data of Xantrine? Daniel. Oh, Daniel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> actually, this is actually an interesting question. Like all the historical data is something that any um, company, small company like us, would love to have. It's to so go out and replicate 1,500 patients, more than 50 clinical trials is, you know, maybe half a billion dollars or more uh, to do. And we get all that free. It didn't necessarily mean that it didn't work everywhere, but even the um, trials where it didn't work tell us something really useful, not only around safety, but also where not to do things and how not to do things. So all of those things go together. We're, it's, you know, there's always risk with developing a drug. Uh, there's not, you can't avoid it. There's something can happen to, you know, there's uh, anything, but it's about as de-risked as we think we can do, uh, make it. Uh, and it's our job to really make the IP as valuable as possible and not really de-risk the drug so much. Um, but, and the way to do that is to identify where it's going to best be suited to be used. So obviously we can use it at a lower dose. Um, that's going to make a big difference because side effects and risk with a, with a drug come with dose. So you get you only have to give the tenth the amount of dose, you'll expect to see far fewer uh, things go wrong uh, in patients. So, yeah, you know, all of those things go together. But really, it's a. Uh, I think it's you know it's what attracted me to race in the first place was the the amount of historical data and the, how de-risked um, the centrin or centrin is as a molecule. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so question on use of funds from the SPP. When will all the SPP or share purchase plan funds be fully deployed? Maybe one for you, Phil. That's a, uh, frankly, that's a difficult one to answer uh, in a binary fashion um, because as we continue to learn, we continue to shape. Um, I'll, I'll, you, I'll, take, I'll give you two answers that will somewhat illustrate um, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, firstly, if you think about the three things we raised for um, from an 80-20 perspective, we said that we would fund a European extension to the AML EMD trial. Uh, we're progressing that behind the scenes. When we've got confirmation, we'll be able to update the market accordingly, but that's on track. And we're, I, I can say, you know, encouraged by a lot of enthusiasm we're getting from Europe for that trial. So, um, so let's say that piece of the three big plans that we announced is underway. Um, Cardio protection was another piece that was supported. Um, what we know about cardio protection, yes, we're excited. You should be able to tell that from this conversation. Um, we're excited for a lot of reasons. But what's really important is that when we go out clinically to execute this, we need to do it in a way that gets support, that it's broad support, and that it's relevant geographically across the regions where we ultimately hope to market the drug. So what we're going to promise you is that we'll do our homework, and by the time we announce exactly that clinical structure, we'll be confident that it's the right structure. Um, that says to your question that, frankly, um, I'm not going to put a date on exactly when we'll get that completed uh, because I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, and the third one's even more difficult because... Um, you're now seeing the melanoma results. You've seen the clear cell renal cell carcinoma results. Um, Daniel and I talk about how many opportunities we've got in FTO, uh, but it's when you've got so many opportunities, the question is, well, which one should we go for? Um, so that may take a little, a little more time. So again, I, I won't give you a time. I'm not sure Daniel wishes to either about when we can actually get that trial away. We could do it soonish, but we've got to make sure we do it optimally. Yeah, so we could rush. Uh, into a trial right now, um, or we could collect all the data we need uh, to maximise the chance of success. Uh, scientists are cheap, uh, and clinicians are expensive, um, and CRO, uh, CROs are ridiculously expensive. So you want to do everything you can in the lab before you start spending money on clinical trials and in patients. And it's the right thing to do for patients. 
you shouldn't rush into a trial just because it's for the company uh, and put patients at risk or give them suboptimal uh, treatment. You want to make sure you know exactly everything you possibly can before you get into the clinic. And that maximises the chance of success and it maximises the chance of uh, a return for shareholders as well. So yeah, measure 100 times, cut once uh, is a good strategy to take in the biotech space. And you just have to look around the market. I'm not going to talk about anything in particular, but there's plenty of examples of people rushing into things and regretting it later. Sounds like a good time for the next question, which was, um, so on the buyback, how was the buyback funded if the management if management raised only as many funds as needed for the trials and activities highlighted in the SDP? Yeah, again, a, fair, a reasonable and fair question. Um, I, should, I should start by saying that, of course, we've always said and we retain a, a view that we only raise um, for programs that deserve to be funded and, and you've supported us accordingly. And, and again, that's we appreciate that. Um, we had capital um, circa $5 million or so before the raise. Um, equally, we received option income and also the R&D grants. So we've had additional working capital available to us. Um, equally, I'll be true to words that I used earlier around the buyback. Um, we've got the opportunity to spend or to purchase up to 4 million shares. That doesn't mean we will. So we will be active and we will purchase appropriately based on uh, available capital outside of committed programs. Yeah, we wouldn't have launched a buyback we didn't believe that you know, we had the capital to do that. Uh, we can't, <clears throat> as Phil's mentioned, we've always returned, looked after, and only raised capital when we have the need. And we have excess capital. The appropriate thing is to return it to our shareholders. It's their money, uh, not for us to just sit on uh, collecting almost no interest in the bank. You guys can spend it on whatever you like. You can go out and buy a jet ski if you like. So you sell your shares, that is. Um, I was busy getting ahead of the game with the questions and I, I was half listening, apologies, but did you mention option? Um, yeah, option income. Yeah, yeah we've, we've had option income. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah that, I that will continues. have option income. That will continue. Yeah. 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 Okay. As will the R&D grants. I should say the R&D grants will accelerate because as our clinical and preclinical investment grows, so will our, our rebates against that uh, from a tax point of view. Okay, uh, so question on addressable markets might be for you, Daniel. Um, how did management arrive at potential capture of total addressable markets as 5% of melanoma, 50% of renal cancer, 20% of AML in the November 21 AGM? Have these percentages changed? What percentage of other opportunities, e.g. 25% if cardio protection, uh, should be considered in races valuation. Yeah, so this is something that, um, uh, well, first I can blame David because they're all David's numbers. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's David Filler. Yes, Fuller. the Fuller, Fuller, the Sorry. CMO. Fuller. Yep. Uh, basically, all these things come down to is a educated guess. You can't really until you actually get out there and do that, and particularly until you get out and do really rigorous market research into this question. You can only... Uh, approximate um, approximate that. Uh, we've expressed that we're going to undertake rigorous market research around cardio protection uh, in this year, and um, we may not be able to share this with our shareholders, um, or we may not share the detail of it anyway, uh, but we're making sure that, you know, we try and identify what we think are the most valuable uh, opportunities going forward. Um, Everyone should go and do their own valuation. They shouldn't rely on us to do it for them. Uh, we've tried to be really conservative. Um, I have my own personal opinion based on um, you know, what I think the potential is. Bill has his. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we agree. All that matters is, is that valuation reflected in our current share price. I think both Phil and I think that the the, op the opportunity and the potential is not currently reflected in the share price. And, you know, it's, as long as there's lots of upside, does it really matter how much that upside is? And a related question um, uh, that there had been, uh, Josh T had mentioned on one of the forums um, that there was an independent valuation being commissioned. What can you tell us about it? And uh, when would the results be presented? 
Okay. So we we have made a decision to present those results. If we do, we're going to uh, undertake that in the near future. It's a complex process uh, <laughs> to go out and do primary market research. You try and estimate, uh, you have a big experienced people who can estimate what the likely uptake of the drug is, what the likely pricing models are, rollout times, all these sorts of things that large pharma or, or anyone else will do. Uh, it's an expensive undertaking, not something you do lightly, uh, but it can potentially guide you and say which particular program should get the most attention. So uh, we'll share as much as we can. Sometimes um, the firms don't like to share that data. Uh, it will involve proprietary information they have internally. They'll be for the board only. Um, but that opportunity, um, you know, we think the opportunity in cardiac protection is quite large. Uh, probably a bit of an understatement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a major problem. It's the <clears> real <throat> thing that, you know, doctors who use chemotherapy fear. Um, they can't really do anything about it. It's just this, you just have to live with it. And it's a terrible outcome for patients. So, you would present a drop in replacement. Uh, Doxorubicin, you can use it exactly as per normal, just works better on the cancer and it protects the heart. Uh, that becomes a very compelling uh, drug to use. It becomes compelling for payers, insurance companies who don't have to deal with the downstream long term side effects which they have to pay for. Uh, it's compelling for the patient. You know, what patient wants to be cured of cancer and end up getting heart failure from it? So all of those things go together to make a really compelling um, opportunity there. And hopefully we'll be able to share at least, you know, a feeling, or not a feeling, an approximation of what the sort of opportunity, the quantum is there on that. So, but other than that, uh, all we can do is work on, you know, <coughs> our best, uh, our best <coughs> estimate, I would say guess, on based on experience and comparables. Thank you. Okay, quick intermission. Uh, thanks for this comment. Congratulations to Race and Jane's team on extremely well-written announcements and keeping open communication with shareholders and all forms of media. Thank you very much. That makes it worthwhile. Yeah. <laughs> um, we long may that continue. Um, uh, okay, and we had a question about that actually, so I might just skip to that because that was from prior to this session. Uh, that was um, okay actually sorry i can't find that i'll come back to that uh so can we expect on ind so a few different questions on inds um so one was can we expect updates on the inds this quarter and then there are a few similar ones um so i'll wrap them into one can you discuss the current status of the two expected inds uh, uh, we tend to we give you as much um, as shareholders as much as we feel confident of what we can deliver in the the time period ahead. Uh, certain programs and activities which we're undertaking. So the IND is one of those. It's ongoing. It's been ongoing almost the whole time I've been involved with race. Very complex process, uh, but it's a lot of it's outside our control. Um, the FDA answers to nobody um, and you just have to go with what happens so you can expect that there will be updates as that program progresses uh, i can't tell you precisely when david who's in charge of that program would not also be able to tell you when so um, all we can say is we're progressing it, it doesn't directly affect any clinical programs we don't need an ind open to undertake any of the clinical programs we've announced are uh, underway. So nice to have at this stage, opens up opportunities, a kind of a credibility builder, but it actually doesn't slow down any of our clinical activities or preclinical activities. So uh, it's not on the critical path. Okay, thank you. I found that question I was looking for, which was, if the buyback strategy is not to artificially drive the share price up, but act as a bit of a base, what is RACE's strategy to onboard more investors, uh, retail and insto, as the volume trading is quite low? And it's fair to say that all those that participated in the share purchase plan and are still red would like to see the share price back up to $3 minimum. Phil? 
Yeah, and we all feel exactly the same. Um, we also participated, um, as you may know. Um, the, yeah, I should say about the buyback, um, the word artificial was in, in the question. Um, we don't want to artificially support the share price. We want to genuinely support the share price. So if we view it as genuinely undervalued, um, we'll obviously try to try to take advantage of that. Um, and I think we said so in the announcement. Um, I, I think the more important part of your question was certainly an acknowledgement that volume is weak. Um, we were discussing this ourselves, in fact, last week. So volume appears to be weak across the sector broadly. So but frankly, it's our problem to, to address and to solve. And, and we'll continue to market. So some of you would be aware that Daniel was up on the Gold Coast three weeks ago, I think. Yeah, the end of um, June. Marketing, you know, to the audience, but equally one-on-one -on -one to a great many shareholders. And we believe we've picked up new investors through that program. Um, we have other programs underway. Um, we work through a number of the investment portals that you would be aware of. Um, but Daniel and I are out walking the streets here and there, and we're certainly committed to doing so in the month of August particularly. Uh, and I think microcaps Melbourne. Yeah, so October later this year, we've got the microcap conference, which will be two days. So any Melbourne shareholders, please get yourselves on the list yeah. for that. Yeah, um, um, but but I think your question is a great question. We need to market. We need to attract new investors. And that's another reason why we're here tonight talking to you, uh, hopefully existing shareholders, but hopefully some new ones as well. And equally, if race seems like a good idea for any of your, uh, you know, counterparts please share the good word Encourage them. um it's always a balance you can spend in a company you can spend all your time on marketing uh and that's good for marketing uh maybe good for the share price but it's not going to actually um you know develop a drug or you know undertake a clinical trial so we have to spread our attention we're a relatively small team uh we're growing but uh, we get an amazing amount done and we have to balance everything we do so as much as I love going out and talking to all the shareholders and thanks to all the shareholders who came along the Gold Coast and I got to chat to you. And there's a lot of you that I didn't get to chat to. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I'm hoping we'll get more as COVID hopefully comes to a bit more of a halt uh, going into spring and summer. Uh, we'll be able to get out and about and meet more people. So uh, all we can do is just keep telling the story, keep delivering the results, um and keep driving the company forward um and ultimately get to the ultimate goal of getting this drug back onto the market and patients being uh, treated that would be a, a good place to stop but we're not going to do that we've got a few more questions here so um <laughs> uh one here on privatization so could delisting race be beneficial to shareholders given there's been a huge discrepancy between actual share price and what most think the fair value is. The background to that is the share price will be used as a reference point to any farmer interested in acquiring race. A low share price can be detrimental to the buyout outcome. Yeah, mm. that, I think that's something that we're all aware of. Um, we're a public company. Anyone can come along at any time and make an offer. The same thing can happen if you're a private company. It doesn't stop... Uh, a company, if you're a private company, a pharma company can come along and make an offer and you still have shareholders. So it doesn't really solve that problem. What we've taken is the what we've termed in the past under the radar strategy of not exposing ourselves unnecessarily to attention until we're ready. Uh, we hope to be you know, ready in the not too distant future. Uh, but ultimately, it's up to the shareholders. If they get an offer and they accept it, um, that we can't, we can't control that. All we can do is uh, do the best we, we can, get the best result for the shareholders. And if they accept, even if it's a fraction of the true value of the company, then it's, it's the shareholder's decision. Mm. Okay. Um, thank you. So we're getting close to time. I'll add in a couple of questions and I'll hand back sure. to you guys to um, provide concluding comments. Quite a few here on partnering. So I'll throw one in. Um, and again, if your question gets wrapped up, it's because there are quite a few. Um, can you please explain the rationale for the planned outreach and marketing of race to major pharmaceutical companies commencing later this year when the company will likely only have phase two data for the relapse and refractory AML 
trial in Israel and phase 1B uh, results for EMD AML trial here in Australia. Would there be merit in holding off until you have similar phase 2 data for cardio protection and solid tumour trials in mid-2023, given they will be given, uh, given they will be such uh, significant value drivers underpinning the valuation and therefore buy out price? Mm. Um, that's um, good perspective. Um, it's obvious that we're in a better position today than we were even three months ago in respect of cardio protection um, and, and frankly, um, FTO with some of the melanoma data. Um, so as our data gets better, our prospects rise. Um, uh, unfortunately, the share price doesn't reflect that. So as said earlier, um, share prices can be a reference. And so um, that's that's one thing we'd like to take care of. So I often talk about a staircase. We would like to move ourselves up a staircase that we grow according to our results. And, and, and as that follows, there can be appropriate times to market. <clears throat> you mentioned that we have said that, you know, we have the ability and um, we could be marketing our business and our results later this year. Um, but frankly, as you acknowledged, um, with more data, We'll, we will be in a better position later to do so. So it's very much a judgment for the board. Um, we've got to take judgments around, you know, what's the right time to put data out there? Um, you can go out, you can sell, you can sell a business with preclinical data. That's possible. Um, but the more clinical data we get and the better our IP picture is, the, the more value we know we'll realise. So we're, we're, unfortunately, we'll never be able to go out and say to you, look, we're going to do it next month or we're going to do it in three months. We will only ever be able to tell you when we've landed a partnership or a licence or, frankly, uh, an acquisition of us by, by someone at the time when that occurs. So um, some of this needs to remain commercial and confident. So um, it's a judgment, and all I can suggest is that we're trying to make the appropriate judgments on when we do it and how we do it. Yeah, well, I... All I can say is, as Phil mentioned at the beginning, I'm the largest shareholder. I've got zero interest in selling out cheaply. Um, and I'll do my best. And I guess that's, you know, I know Phil's going to do his best and the rest of the team, they put in an amazing effort into, I continue to be, how much passion there is within the team at Grace. They can see on a day-to-day -day basis what uh, Xantrin's delivering. Uh, and, and the promise it, sh it shows, and they continue to be working after hours on the weekend at night, having meetings at midnight because that's the only time you can actually talk to somebody because of time zones. Mm. Uh, uh, and that's driven by knowledge of what we have. Uh, and, you know, I'm proud to be part of that. Uh, and it's really pleasing. Like, these are really great people. Uh, you know, very experienced, I wouldn't go so as far as cynical, um, but, you know, they've seen a lot and they're really passionate about what we have. Um, and hopefully more shareholders will feel the same. And I'm, many of the shareholders I meet and talk to share that same passion. So it's, a, it's a really nice to be involved in all of this. So, yeah, keeps me motivated anyway. Well, actually... That's a pretty nice way to end things, I think. Phil, I might just hand back to you for any final concluding remarks that you might have. Um, yeah, I, I would probably echo my my current bias given the results we've had for cardio protection. Um, it's a it's a genuinely unmet need. Um, we have a genuine point of difference in the results we can generate. Um, both not only in cardio protection, but equally in cancer efficacy. So um, our, our job, and you, you would have read it if you read the quarterly in detail, um, comments by the chair and, and, and us broadly, you know, the opportunities there, we need to go forward and, and prosecute it as best we can, and we'll do exactly that, but we'll do it carefully on, and on a considered basis. So um, trust that, you know, if things aren't happening tomorrow, that's for the right reasons, but they'll happen when they can. Um, so certainly pushing that board as best we can and not forgetting about FTO. Um, that's certainly uh, there <laughs> and it's, it may be in the background, but it's very it's getting a lot of um, appropriate focus. So yeah. I'll, I'll equally say that. I won't let Phil forget about FTO. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we're coming up on time. Um, I, we really appreciate the opportunity to give you further perspective on the quarterly. Um, it was a great quarter. And as Daniel said, well, um, the team's working really hard, really well. Small team gets a hell of a lot done. And we do so, uh, we think, economically in respect of how we use your funds. We're investing, um, but 
but importantly, we appreciate your support and your continued support. So um, talk to your friends. If they're not in race, we hope they might be in the future. Um, <laughs> it's a long road ahead, but it's a road that goes up a, a staircase. That's that's what we're trying to deliver. Um, so again, thanks. And we look forward to doing this again in the near future. Thank you. And with that, everyone will keep you across our progress and we invite you to disconnect and uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks again.